Hey guys, this is Andrew with HKN. And today we're going to be talking about uh, finally getting into the optimal receiver for digital communication networks. Um, and specifically, this is going to be split up into either two or three videos. Um, but the first part, uh, we kind of have a narrative we want to follow in developing this receiver. Um, and then eventually we're going to get into an example of how to put everything we've been talking about together. Um, and the uh, part that we're going to talk about right now is signal space. Um, basically how we're going to um, put all of our signals into some kind of uh, representation. Uh, so just like last time we talked about um, vectors and orthonormal bases, um, specifically how to represent signals in, uh, as vectors, you can think of the space that um, these vectors occupy as, you know, they're, it's not Euclidean space, so it's not R2, it's not R3, they may be equivalent, but specifically they're a space that signals exist in, and so we call that the signal space. Um, and so in order to start talking about an optimal receiver, we need to think about the situation that we're, op that we're operating in. And the situation that we're going to assume we're operating in, uh, which is called the model for the channel, channel being... Uh, which place that we're sending all of our messages down. So in order to get from S to R, which means sender receiver, um, or signal to received signal, uh, it has to go down this line. But as it's going down this line, we have this plus symbol here indicating that we get something added on top of it. We call that noise. Um, so I'll write that down here. This is the noise. Uh, it gets corrupted somehow. Um, and at the output, we get a received signal, which is the signal plus the noise. This noise specifically is called additive white Gaussian noise. Um, and what that means is that this signal, R of T, can be written as the sent signal, S of T, plus the noise, eta of T. Um, that's the additive part. The white Gaussian part means that uh, the at any point in time, the value that this number ta that this ta takes on, so like say eta of t zero, say eta of t zero, this is distributed as a normal distribution with zero mean and variance. Uh, let's we're going to call this variance n zero over two. Um, the over two is just a convention we use. So this is the variance of the noise and it's zero mean. Um, the, that's the Gaussian part. Uh, so we have the additive and the Gaussian part. The white part um, means that R sub eta sub eta of tau, which is the autocorrelation function. If you don't know what the autocorrelation function is, it's an expectation of these variables for different T zeros. So say it would be the expected value of eta t0 times eta t1. Uh, and tau is the difference between those times. Uh, we have a video on the autocorrelation function and what it is. I suggest you go watch it to familiarize yourself with it. But specifically, white is defined as being it's the variance when there's no difference in time. Um, and otherwise, it's zero. So that's written as a delta function. Um, and this is not the Kronecker delta function, this is the Dirac delta function. And what that means is that uh, it's actually infinity at zero and uh, zero otherwise. So it actually can't exist, you can't have an infinite amount of variance in power. But it's a good enough model uh, and it's realistic for in-band noise. Uh, we go over that in the video on uh, random processes. So I would suggest going and watch that to familiarize yourself if this concept does not make sense to you. Um, so we are going to assume that our receiver knows all of our phi sub k's. So the receiver knows all our set of phi sub k's from k equals 1 up to capital K. So the receiver has knowledge of it. Um, and what we want to do is we need to give the receiver a set of rules 
for deciding, uh, it also has the set of signals that's going, that are going to be sent. So say for it'll know, um, there may not be as many of these, so let's call them N. N equals one up to capital N of S of T. So it knows these as well. And we need to give it a set of rules to decide which signal was sent. based on the received signal. So that's what the optimal receiver will do. And the optimal receiver will spe specifically take these rules and apply them in a way such that the amount of errors we get is minimized. Um, so, the framework which we're going to use, or the philosophy which we're going to be using, is called the maximum a posteriori, or the maximum after knowledge of after the fact, or before the fact, um, decision uh, system. And basically, this is a probabilistic system. Um, and what it says is that the signal we're going to decide on, which is going to be called S hat of T, is equal to the argmax, which means that the output of this function is the argument over N of the probability, which we're going to write as P, of the received signal being, of getting the received signal given that S sub N was sent times the probability that S sub N was sent. Uh, it's a little bit off screen, but that's times the probability that S sub N was sent. Um, and basically, this says we want to pick the signal that maximizes the probability of us getting the received signal. So if we know that the received signal was sent, that, that uh, say, say that the first signal was sent, if that has the largest probability of producing the received signal, then we decide that the first signal was sent. And we basically are going to look at all of the signals and pick the one that maximizes the probability of actually getting what we saw. Um, this works in general, uh, so that means that for any probability of a signal being sent, you know, I can maybe send a 1 twice as often as I send a 0. Um, this is the general one for that. But in the case, so for a special case, where the probability of getting Sn of t, of sending Sn of t is equal to 1 over the number of signals, then we can simplify this because we know that when we maximize a constant, so this will be a constant for any n, we know that this constant won't matter because when we maximize anything, constants don't come into effect. So, we would change our s hat of t to just being the argmax over n of the probability of r of t given s n of t. And we would have a constant out here, but we won't care about that constant, so we're just going to drop it off. Um, and actually, this is called the maximum likelihood detector. So in order to go from maximum a posteriori to maximum likelihood criteria, all you have to do is assume that the probability that every signal is sent is the same. And if we're dealing with bits, you got to figure you're going to send a zero about as often as you send a one, unless there's some special uh, format to your signal uh, to your uh, to your alphabet. 
Um, so you figure that's true for most cases, and in most cases we're going to be working with the maximum likelihood receiver. Now that we have a framework for decision making here, we need to define the above probability. So this guy here, we need to be able to figure out what this probability is for every signal we're going to send. Um, it's a pretty difficult problem if you're just looking at the, the time valued signals. So using the discrete signals that we have uh, been working with, so using the discretized version of these signals, should probably help us in defining these probabilities. So we know that we can express our n signals, right? We can, we can write our set of s of t's from n equals 1 up to capital N using our basis set phi k's k equals 1 up to cap k of phi k of t where k cap k is less than or equal to capital N. Um, so what does projecting our received signal, for instance, our R of t, onto this basis do? So if we're going to use our signal space, it's easy enough to express S in that signal space. Um, and in our uh, so when I say signal space, it means our basis set as well. But what does that do to our received signal? Well, if we do this, what we get uh, is that we're going to get a set of k numbers, um, our received vector is going to equal to a set of k vectors that are all in the direction of the signals. So we're going to have, say, a signal orig originated set. So this is going to be s sub n sub k. So this is the nth element of r of the r vector is going to equal to the nth of the element of the uh, of the r vector projected onto the kth basis function plus some noise in that direction. Uh, this would be the kth direction. So there's some noise there. Uh, sorry, this would also be the kth direction. So this is some the signal n projected onto the kth direction. So if we look up here, right, r is s times eta. So the nth component of r, so if we project r onto these bases uh, using our dot product projection formula, um, we're going to get the nth, the projection onto the nth basis of R is equal to the projection of the nth basis onto S plus the projection onto the nth basis of the noise. So there's some, so basically we take our time signal and express it as a vector and it's not much different. So these are components, but you can write the whole vector as it. Um, so the signal contributing term is a constant vector and the noise term is a vector of random variables or a random vector that we don't know the distribution of. So specifically, this is all signal oriented or originated. This is some constant. Uh, this is random, right? The only thing random in this is eta. And because even though it's a projection onto it, it will be a number in general for all cases. This is going to be some random number. Um, Remember, signal or originated, noise originated, uh, kth elements. And this is going to be some distribution on the, uh, but we don't know what it is. So it's going to be specifically the R vector is equal to the signal vector that we sent. Say we send the nth vector, so the nth, uh, the nth signal, plus some noise vector 
where this is a random vector, this is constant, and this is a random vector because n is. Um, we don't know the distribution on eta, but you can probably guess what it's going to be. Um, it's, in general, coming from a Gaussian, and Gaussians lead to other Gaussians. So it's probably going to be Gaussian. Um, and in general, we should be able to express our received signal here as equal to the set of R's. So it's R projected onto basis 1, R projected onto basis 2, R projected onto basis 3, all the way up to R projected onto basis capital K. Plus, there's no guarantee that this will not have any leftover components after we're done projecting it onto all of the bases. So in order to get this to be equal, I'm going to call this N remainder. But because we know that all of our signal originated information, so everything from S could be uh, could be constructed out of the phi's, and this remainder could not be constructed out of the phi's, we know that it could not have been signal originated. So we get rid of it. We don't use it because we know it didn't come from the signal. Literally, we know it's noise, so we throw it away. And so we just deal with this vector of projected R's onto the basis. Um, we don't know uh, what this, what these numbers are going to be, but we can, we can think about what, um, the, uh, what the value of this, n this normal, uh, Gaussian vector is going to be. Um, the expected, the, this vector eta, right, which is going to be the, part of the noise in direction of phi 1, phi 2, so on and so forth, um, the expected value or the mean of this vector is a vector of zeros. So they're all zero mean. And I'm going to skip the math to prove that. But you can kind of understand that if it starts out zero mean, it's going to end zero mean. Um, so that's kind of intuitive, it's pleasing, and uh, the math's a little too complicated for me to want to deal with right now. So just take my word for it that they are zeros. Um, but the, because they're Gaussian, that means that we don't only need the mean, we also need the covariance of all of these. Multivariate Gaussian distributions, which these are all Gaussian, um, need to have covariances attached to them. So specifically, each one of these variables will have a variance, but there's no indication that they may not be correlated. So we can do a calculation and figure out that indeed the expected value of any noise component multiplied by any other noise component conjugate, which is how you take expectations, um, is just going to equal to n0 over 2 times delta ij, and this is the Kronecker delta, signified by writing it with square brackets. So it's 0 when they're not the same, and the noise variance of the original noise when they are the same. So basically what that means, when you have Gaussians and they are uncorrelated, that means only for Gaussians that they are independent. So each one of the noise components is independent and distributed the same as the original noise. And I honestly think that that's an amazing thing to come out. The fact that the power of each one of the components here is the same as the power of the original noise um, is kind of a crazy thing to me and that there's still zero mean. Um, and that's kind of a really interesting fact. And it tells us that the components of the random vectors are uncorrelated and independent with variance equal to that of the original process. And it's important and a direct consequence of the orthonormal property of the basis sets 
and the fact that the noise is additive white Gaussian. So first of all, this is not true if, for, if the noise was not AWGN, did not have these properties. And if the phi's were not orthonormal, this would also not be true. So that is the whole point of these being normal. You can express signals using not uh, perpendicular or normalized uh, or ortho orthogonal um, basis. It's the property that these are orthogonal. These need to be orthogonal. Sorry, I said normal, I meant orthogonal. If these were not orthogonal, this would not be true. Um, and that's the reason it's very important. If you want to see the reasoning for it, I'm going to attach a PDF in the description of this uh, and every video in this series. And you'll see the calculation for why, uh, how this comes out and how it's a property of the fact that um, the phi's are all orthonormal um, and, that the, um, and that the noise is additive white Gaussian. Um, and so now that we have some statistics about these, um, we're going to go back to our formulation here of the maximum likelihood receiver. But we're actually going to do that next time uh, because this video is going to get a little long otherwise. So we're going to split this up into three videos. We're doing the signal space right now. And we got up to how we express the noise in signal space uh, when the noise is just additive white Gaussian. Uh, we started on making the decision fat for our receiver, but we came to the point where we needed to express our received signal into uh, signal space. And so next time we'll pick up back here at the maximum likelihood receiver, which remember is a special case of the maximum a posteriori receiver. Um, and we'll start again from there using this new information. Um, I will rewrite it in the next video. I uh, hope you guys learned something and have a nice day.